1986, as president, he signed an immigration bill that legalized millions of undocumented immigrants, what Republicans today would call an amnesty bill. And of course, his crowning achievement as president, after a lifetime as an anti staunch anti-communist, he wound up spending his his second term as president working with the world's leading communist, Mikhail <laughs> Gorbachev, to yeah. end the Cold War and reform the Soviet Union, even at a time when a lot of conservatives said that he was being snookered, that, that Gorbachev was taking him for a ride. Hey folks, welcome to the Michael Steele Podcast. It's always a pleasure when I have you in the house here at the podcast. Uh, if you like our podcast, of course, you know what to do. You're going to tell a friend and share it and give us a review on Apple Podcasts. We love it when you do that. Check us out on Twitter uh, at uh, Steele underscore podcast. Follow me at Michael Steele. Uh, and of course, this podcast is brought to you by the Bulwark Network. Follow them on social media at Bulwark Online. And I'm very proud to be a part of that. So I'm excited today uh, to have someone that I've admired and followed uh, his work and his writing a long time, uh, Max Boot. Uh, he's a best-selling author, historian, and policy analyst. Uh, he's a columnist for The Washington Post, a global affairs analyst for CNN, uh, and the Gene J. Kirkpatrick Senior Fellow in National Security Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. He is the author of the New York Times bestsellers, The Road Not Taken, Edward Lansdale and the American Tragedy in Vietnam. And his latest book, Reagan, His Life and Legend, is out now. We get into the book uh, about the man who inspired me to become a Republican. What do you know? We're going to talk about all of that right here on the Michael Steele podcast right after this. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Michael Steele podcast. Excited as always when you are spending a little bit of time with us. It is uh, fall. OK, so we've got about a couple of weeks left in summer. But when you turn the corner in September, for me, it's fall. And so I get in a whole different vibe. Everything looks um, and feels different. And that is all heightened this year because we're in, a, in an intense political environment. So you have that. Uh, you've got, um, you know, weather being a little bit crazy. You've got that. But there are always some threads in, in, in life that, you know, you take a moment and you just want to take a step back and look and sort of assess. And for me, um, that happened with a new book uh, that is uh, out and and really, really kind of putting in space for us and contextualizing not just a period that we many of us remember in the 1970s and 80s uh, and 90s with Ronald Reagan, but even today. Uh, so, so I'm excited to have Max Boot on to talk about his new book, Reagan, His Life and Legend. It's out now. Max, it's such a pleasure to have you here to talk about this book. Um you know, I was asked a question recently about uh, why I became a Republican and the significance of Reagan in the context of Trump. And what I referenced was the Reagan 76 uh, concession when he was asked uh, by uh, Gerald Ford to come up and say a few words at the end of that convention where there was a lot of tension and a lot of political play. And Reagan got up, and I remember watching that as um, a young 17-year-old uh, that summer who would turn 18 that October and vote that November for the first time, just being awed by how he handled defeat. And it's a quality of leadership that I think a lot of people don't understand and a lot of people miss because we're so fixated on winning. And it really struck me as a young man that if this person can stand in that space at that hour in that room and have that kind of grace about what was happening to him personally, and despite how he may have felt personally, but then have an eye towards the future and saw 
a place where this where he could play a role in moving the country still? Damn, that was a guy I wanted to follow. What what inspired you to write um this book, a book that it's intricately enough um out today, uh just uh, just a, a, a I think a blazingly important um uh review by the New York Times noting the book is gripping it's a gripping new biography boots book enters a crowded field but stands out for its deep research lucid prose and command of its subject broad political and social context in other words you hit a home run with this and that you really and in reading in reading what I what I received from your publisher I just you you really do drill down and and so what what about this version of Reagan that you want us to know and why now? Well, thank you very much for having me on, Michael. It's it's a pleasure to be on with you. And like you, I was made into a Republican in part by Ronald Reagan in my case in the 1980s. Now, of course, you know I'm not a Republican anymore. I'm an independent, so I'm not writing uh, as 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 a fan. I'm writing as a serious historian trying to get the story right so that it's neither a hagiography nor a hit job, but really tells the story of Ronald Reagan with both his successes as well as his shortcomings. And I was mm -hmm. really aiming to produce the definitive biography. So I was delighted today to see the New Yorker review saying that I had achieved that very ambition. But that's, you know, that's really why I set out to do this, uh, to do this book more than a decade ago was because I felt like there were a lot of books about Reagan, but not one that really nailed his place in history, not one that presented a well-balanced, in-depth portrait of him. And that's, that's really what I've tried to achieve so that uh, we can really understand uh, Reagan and 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 and, he, and even if a new generation that didn't know Reagan or wasn't aware of him personally can understand his significance and why he's still generally ranked by historians as being a top ten president. Yeah, you know, it, it's 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 an important uh, point to make because a lot of folks do not have that 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 tissue connection to Reagan. I mean, you know, time. Time does a, a terrible thing. Um, it, it 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 can break those bonds that we once had, uh, and certainly as newer generations come into into play, that tissue becomes that connection becomes less and less. Which is why I think uh, you referenced the New Yorker um, again. Their their review of this book stated very clearly Reagan, his life and legend aims to be the definitive biography, and it succeeds. Um, it's a thoughtful, absorbing account, um, and it's a surprising one. And, and I think it's I think that's important in terms of trying to, in this environment, give folks um, an appropriate frame of reference about a historic figure, but also um, reconnect that dot, if you can, or, or those tissues for a lot of us, who, you know, we're talking the 1970s for me, the 1980s for you and and for many others when when they first kind of watched Reagan and learned of him and experienced him, bringing that alive for people is what you accomplish in this book in a real way. And how, how do you do that? Um, with this gap in time, you know, it's just, you know, I know you'd spend a lot of time reading a lot of stuff, a lot of other stuff that was, had been written about Reagan and, and Reagan's own uh, writings and letters and things like that. At a certain point, you really get to know the man. Uh, and how do you bring him back to life for uh, this age? Well, that's a great question. And it really involved a lot of research and a lot of research into his personal papers, his uh, professional papers, a lot of interviews with people who knew him. And I was kind of lucky with this book that I kind of hit a sweet spot in terms of research because we were far enough away from the Reagan presidency that a lot of the passions around him have cooled. And so people are ready to talk about him more reflectively, more dispassionately. But there, are, there were people who knew him very well who were still around when I was doing the research. Some of them are still around. Others have since passed away. But I was you know, able to talk to a lot of people who knew him that future generations of historians are not going to be able to reach. And then at the same time, I also benefited from huge new releases of documents at the Reagan Library. And so a lot of documents 
that you know journalists didn't have when they were covering him in the 80s we now have as historians and we can so i spent a lot of time in the very chilly reading room of the Reagan Library <laughs> in CB Valley going through all this stuff. But, you know, the other thing that kind of made it possible, I think, to try to bring him back alive for people who didn't know him was also looking at the at the popular culture context. And yeah. that's something that I did throughout the book from, you know, his his early adult years during the Great Depression, writing about, you know, songs like Brother, Can You Spare a Dime, bringing home the 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 misery and and, and the terror of of the Great Depression, you know, up through the 60s and 70s and into the 80s and writing about the 1980s, you know, the the era where Madonna sang I'm a Material Girl to mm -hmm. kind of captures the ethos in some ways of the era. So, you know, connecting Reagan's story with the larger story of American culture, because he was really shaped by that culture, but he in turn also really shaped the culture. And you can see it just like in something as simple as portrayals of the military, because Remember when Reagan was coming into office, the military was portrayed as, you know, psychopaths and deer hunter or yeah. balls in movies like Stripes or Private Benjamin. And then a, a few years into the Reagan presidency, all those images had been transformed into Top Gun and Rambo uh, and the Hunt for Red October. So a much more positive uh, image of, of the U.S. military, which is it certainly wasn't all Reagan's doing, but he contributed to it and he kind of led the way. Well, that, that's an important point, too, because I, when I'm thinking back on it, you're absolutely right. I hadn't really connected that transitional dot from the 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 impact of the Vietnam War and uh, the CIA's bad behavior and a lot of the stuff that government was doing in the late 60s and 70s, how Hollywood portrayed that. And by the time you get to 83, 84 and the second uh, and the second reelect that that narrative had begun to change about our military and a lot about our culture. Um, it also started to reflect itself in some of the music. And 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 I think a lot of that had to do with how Reagan performed as president as much as what he was putting out in terms of specific policies. In other words, he, more so than any other president probably since Roosevelt, also culturally tapped into uh, the American psyche and sort of moved the country in a way. And you know I'm putting a pin in that because I'm going to relate that to Donald Trump uh, in, in 2016 in a moment. But he was able to do that in such a way that... Uh, culturally move the country, politically move the country as he was as he was talking about America as a shining city on the hill. And that began to be reflected in how we saw ourselves and how we saw our institutions. Absolutely. He really understood the performative aspect of the presidency in a way that Jimmy Carter, for example, absolutely did not. And a lot of that really comes from Franklin Roosevelt, who was Reagan's boyhood idol uh, in the 1930s or, or idol as a young man. He he grew up as an art new dealer. He really idolized FDR and he learned lessons from FDR about how to communicate. I mean, in the 1930s, Reagan, like much of the country, was they were listening to Roosevelt on the fireside chats. And Reagan was understanding that radio was a very good medium of political communication, which he later used himself. Even as president, he did these weekly radio talks, which is pretty unusual in the 1980s. And I think part of the reason he was doing that was because he understood from listening to FDR's radio talks, how effective radio could be. And of course, Reagan was also a master of TV. He was the first president to host a national television show before becoming president. He was the host of General Electric Theater in the 1950s. And again, that's where he learned a lot of his communication abilities and, and his mastery of the medium of television. And he was probably one of the two best TV performers as mm -hmm. president alongside John F. Kennedy. He was a master of that medium as well. And so he really understood how to communicate his message. Now, I will say he was a great leader and a great communicator. He wasn't such a great manager. He was not that good at running the nuts and bolts of the government. And he, uh, he, you know, left a lot of that to his aides, the fellows, as he called them, to do. And so he got good results when he had good aides like Jim Baker and others in the first term. The results were a little bit more mixed when, like in the second term, you had Don Regan, who didn't know what he was doing as chief of staff. So that became very problematic. But he was so he had, you know, his weakness, I would say, was management. But his strength was 
communicating and inspiring. And that was really, he understood that lay at the heart uh, of being a president. And that really transformed the national mood and changed our politics and and, and won him this amazing reelection in 1984, which you can't imagine today, anybody winning 49 out of 50 states. Oh. He did. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I can't. I can't imagine that happening anytime soon. Um, I, I love the way you began uh, his story. And there's a lot, I, I think a lot of people don't really appreciate what football and being a lifeguard meant to Reagan and how it actually shaped him as a, as a young man, um, along with the work he did in Hollywood that sort of honed those skills uh, that you were just referring to. Um, but that aspect of his life, his childhood, his family, talk a little bit about how that shaped him. Because again, put a pin in that, I think it it sort of shapes, um, well, put it this way, the personality of a president who is the titular head of, of the party, whether it's Republican or Democrat, tends to sort of push that side of himself into, into the body politic. And we all kind of mimic, feel, and become a part of that, that person's energy, if you will. Um, and, and I'm curious how you saw those things, those elements of his life, shaping the kind of president he would become. Well, you're right that that was an incredibly important part of his life. I mean, I would pull back the camera a little bit further and just say that, as I do in the book, that he was really a product of the early 20th century small town Midwest, which mm. may surprise people because we tend to think of him as a Californian, as a Westerner, as a cowboy figure. But he actually grew up in these Norman Rockwell type small towns in, in Illinois. He was you know, as I say in the book, uh, Main Street USA became, uh, uh, you know, an attraction at Disneyland, but he lived in the actual Main Street USA. Right, right. Small towns like Tampico and Dixon uh, with all of the, you know, kind of strengths and weaknesses of that time and place. And there were certainly weaknesses, including, uh, you know, white Americans like Reagan were often overlooked what their, what their African-American neighbors were suffering at that time. But there was also kind of a resiliency a, a, a belief in America and a belief in themselves that really took Reagan far. And I think those that resiliency and that belief in himself was really, it grew by leaps and bounds when he was a lifeguard on the Rock River in Dixon, Illinois, throughout his high school and college years, where he li literally saved 77 people from drowning. And some people, you know, some cynics have said, oh, well, that's an I must be an exaggeration. That must not be true. But I looked into it. A lot of things that Reagan said about himself were exaggerations. A lot of things were not true. This is true. He actually did say right, he actually did it. Seven people. So he was actually <laughs> a hometown hero. He was like a, a big man in a little town. And he, uh, you know, I think it taught him uh, he enjoyed being of service to people. Right. He enjoyed, uh, you know, doing something for other people, saving them from drowning. And he also, quite frankly, enjoyed the adulation that came with that. He enjoyed the renown that he that he, he gained from that. And you know, he had his ego was much more firmly in check than most politicians or most presidents, but he had an ego too, and he enjoyed the applause that he got, you know, for life saving feats, just as he enjoyed the applause that he received, uh, you know, as a football player or as an actor, which which he did in, in both high school and in college, and of course later on in Hollywood. And all of that really shaped him. And I think, you know, one of the things he learned as a as a as a football player. Uh, you know, at Dixon High School and at Eureka College was, and he wasn't a great football player, by the way. He was not that athletically talented. His brother Moon was Oof. much more talented. Mm -hmm. But Dutch Reagan, as he then was called, was a great team player. He really worked hard. He did what was expected of him. He really listened to his coaches. And those were, uh, you know, those are not necessarily leadership traits, but those are traits that allowed him eventually to become a leader because it was that ethos that allowed him to succeed in Hollywood, where again, he wasn't the most talented actor, but he was pretty successful because he delivered what directors needed. And then, you know, later on working for General Electric in the 1950s, he really salvaged his career after his Hollywood career went south. And again, he delivered what the management of GE wanted. So he was very, very good at, at meeting ex or even exceeding expectations, working hard. He was very diligent and he learned his craft and eventually all that translated into his 
uh, rise to political leadership in California and the country. He found the fullness uh, of life wherever he could. It, it seemed, at least that's the feeling in, in the way you've written about that early uh, period of his life. I was, I chuckled at one point and I highlighted it uh, where you were talking about um, early in the book about how fo football was such, you were just referencing football was such an important part for him. Um, and in particular, you wrote about, uh, you know, the very first letter uh, of his that survives written at age 11 in 1922 to an older girl who had moved to Wisconsin is filled mainly with football news. Quote, Dixon High School has played 10 games, one, three, tied one, he wrote before noting that he was the drum major of the YMCA band and that he had 12 rabbits and I'm going to kill three and eat them. <laughs> yeah. it just, this is like, it, it's funny because I've actually been watching, you know, this great show Friday Night Lights and he was actually living kind of that Friday Night Lights world as a young man. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the part of it. it you know, it, it is that, that little bit for me is sort of, it, it is Americana is written with innocence yeah, it's written by an eleven-year-old, so you can expect some of that. But you can just knowing Reagan as we have come to know him, and then reading something like that, it, it all kind of connected for me, at least, and made a lot of sense. You know how how he how he saw the world um, at one at, at once um, very pragmatic, um, but at the same time, you know there was this this aspirational aspect. Um, about it as well, because, um, you know, as you go on to note that, you know, he he wanted to to go on. And as you say here, he even began to dream of going to college, a seemingly impossible goal for a young boy like him so that he could become a football star, just like the fictional Frank Merriwell at Yale. So he, he was able to, and of course, going up and playing Newt Rockney and all of that later on in life, for him was sort of like a completion of a goal, I guess. Yeah, no, he was, he was, I mean, one of the interesting things about Reagan is, again, he often, usually, in fact, hid his ambition, right? He, he always talked about when he was running for office that it wasn't like he was seeking higher office, it was the office was seeking him, that people were just demanding that he run, and he was just listening to the voice of the people. Right. Some of that was 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 a ruse. Some of that was real, but there's no question he had real ambition. And, you know, it's amazing how far he got from being this, this, this offspring of this very impoverished family, his father, this alcoholic shoe salesman, moving from one town to another and throughout Illinois, uh, his mother being very religious, uh, and very inspirational, but often fighting with his father, very troubled upbringing. And yet, he was able to go to college. And his parents, by the way, left school after elementary school. They didn't even have a high school education, but he wound up being able to go to college, which was a tremendous achievement because, you know, today, like a third of Americans or something like that go to college. Back then, it was like one or two percent. It was a very right. small slice of the population able to go to college. And then even getting out of college at the height of the Great Depression in 1932, when the unemployment rate was like 20 percent, he was dreaming of becoming an actor. And he figured out how to make it happen because he understood that there were uh, no film studios in Illinois, but there were a lot of radio stations in the right. area. He found a radio station in Davenport, Iowa that would hire him. And before long, he was famous throughout the Midwest as the voice of the, of the Cubs and the White Sox. He was calling games that were heard throughout the region. And then you know, one year when, when the Cubs were going for spring training to Catalina Island off the coast of California, he went with them, and then he snuck away from spring training to get a screen test, a screen test at Warner Brothers. And that, you know, within a few months, in 1937, Warner Brothers hires him as an actor. And all of a sudden, this this poor boy from Dixon, Illinois, is rising to become a star in Hollywood. I mean, what an improbable, only in America kind of story. But he didn't stop there. You know, even when his his Hollywood career uh, fizzled out after mm -hmm. World War II, he he found this new life on. General Electric Theater, and then transitioned by the 1960s into a life of politics. And the very first race he ran was for governor of the nation's most populous state. And he won that race by a million votes. I mean, that's that's a heck of a track record and, and shows that he had this hidden drive, this hidden ambition, which he didn't run his sleeve, but it was there. It was there. 
Uh, and it would manifest itself, uh, as you said, in politics. You mentioned already he was a New Dealer. You have the chapter, The New Dealer, and he notes, I was a child of the Depression, a, a Democrat by upbringing, and very emotionally committed to FDR. Um, and and two things. What was the source of that commitment? Was it growing up in poverty, seeing the poverty around him, and then having this 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 idea placed in front of the country um, that Roosevelt had this new deal that he wanted to create for middle America to put them back to work, to, to restore the economy. So what made him a new dealer, but then more importantly, what made him a Republican? What, and, and how much of that did he bring into his Republicanism? Cause I've always made this, you know, having been a chairman, uh, and dealt with candidates, um, of all stripes, particularly with those who leave uh, the Democratic Party, for example, to become Republicans or even Republicans who go to the Democratic Party, your core is still still what it is, right? There, there's some core things that animate your, your vision of yourself in the world and your philosophy. Um, and whether you're Elizabeth Warren or, or um, Hillary Clinton, who were both Republicans in their youth, um, there are aspects of that philosophy that still weaves itself in. And so I'm thinking with Reagan, the same was true, particularly given that his level of, um, you know, he says, I was very emotionally committed to FDR. You just don't walk away from that and leave that all over there. Well, part of that was his family inheritance because his father was Irish American at a time when in the 1920s, when the Republican Party was associated with nativism and anti-Catholic prejudice, whereas at least in, in the North, the Democratic Party was full of Catholics, more liberal. And so, you know, Catholic uh, Irish Americans like Jack Reagan were drawn to the Democratic Party. And so was little Dutch Reagan. And then, of course, you know, he saw the failure of, of Herbert Hoover, the coming of the Great Depression, and then the way that Franklin Roosevelt worked to save the country and saved his father. I mean, his father actually was unemployed and found work uh, in one of the New Deal relief agencies providing aid to his neighbors in Dixon. And so that made Reagan very emotionally connected uh, to the New Deal and, and to FDR. And he really began to change in the 1940s, I think initially, uh, because as a highly paid Hollywood star, he didn't like paying the high tax rates uh, <laughs> during World War II, like 90% taxation. But then it really, I think it really happened after the war where he got caught up in some of the uh, battles over communism in Hollywood, he he became a supporter of the blacklist. And he was, you know, he thought that there was a communist conspiracy to take over Hollywood that he was resisting. I think a lot of that was exaggerated, but it made him a very staunch anti-communist. And then in the 1950s, he went to work for General Electric, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. really saved his career. And General Electric at the time was a very right-wing company. They actively crossed the Really? Tunnels. Yeah, for absolutely, because... For them, spreading free market ideology was basically an inoculation against unionism and strikes. Ah, they thought yes. that this would help their self-interest yep. by yep. convincing by convincing their their executives and employees that unions were part of this global communist conspiracy and had to be resisted. And all so Reagan, you know, would would spend long hours on the train from California to New York going to speak for GE because he was afraid of flying in those days. Mm -hmm. and so he had a lot of time to read a lot of the right wing literature that General Electric passed out uh, to its executives. And so and he began, you know, he began to be converted. Uh, he had already been a staunch anti-communist. But in the 50s, he was also converted to a free market laissez faire uh, ideology in economics. And then it wasn't just this passive process of receiving this information. He was also giving speeches all the time. Yeah. And. There is nothing like, you know, for uh, digesting a worldview, like having to speak about it. And he was speaking about it all the True. time <laughs> with these little index cards, giving speeches on behalf of GE, but they became increasingly political. And so, you know, people speculate about, oh, did his wife, Nancy, or his father-in-law, Loyal Davis, or somebody else, did they convert him? No, not really. I would say it was more, he was already moving in that direction uh, from the from the late 40s, but it was really working for GE that kind of completed his conversion uh, such that by 1960, he was head of Democrats for Nixon. And the only reason he wasn't a Republican was because Richard Nixon himself asked him not to re-register re because it was more powerful 
to have his support as a Democrat. So basically between 45 and 1960, he moved from being, you know, a very staunch New Deal liberal to being a very staunch conservative Republican. It's fascinating. And I, would, I would add one thing that, you know, I think he, he created a mythology around his the why he changed parties, because he's often said, I didn't desert my party, my party deserted me. But when I looked at that, that wasn't really true because the Democratic Party in the 1950s was actually pretty conservative. It was led by Lyndon Johnson, Sam Rayburn. In 1960, John F. Kennedy actually ran to Nixon's right on foreign policy. So it wasn't the Democratic Party going far to the left. It was really this change within Ronald Reagan, which you know, it took some work to to get that story out. That's fascinating in 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 a lot of ways because there is mythology around this whole idea of the party leaving you. But then there's also, at least we can speak in the modern era, and it's obviously to your point on an individual basis where parties do tend to change. And by the time you got to the 60s, you could see, and you're right, John F. Kennedy sort of ran to the right on, on foreign policy, for example. But then you also had a very different dimension and look at uh, the social contract that the government has with the society. And those things began to, I would suspect, eat a little bit more at people's philosophical moorings uh, than they had previously, as you saw the sexual revolution, the Vietnam War. Certainly as a Catholic, I can speak to the changes in the Catholic Church at that time as a young altar boy trying to, we're not saying Latin mass anymore. What are we, what are we doing? You know, it's just, you right. know, the, all those just too much. <laughs> yeah. Well, so you could, it would be plausible if that's what made Reagan into a conservative Republican, if he were a decade younger and if he was making his conversion in the 1960s, but he wasn't. He was really converted fully to the right by the early 60s before all these changes that you're talking about actually yeah. happened. And then he was the leader of the backlash against all that. You know, by, by 1966, he was running uh, for governor of California on a platform of law and order and a platform of doing something about those damn hippies at Berkeley. So he wow. was, yeah, he was true. kind of the, the middle class backlash against the changes that were sweeping the country in the 60s. You framed it exactly how it is. And that that makes a lot a lot of sense in terms of his his own personal evolution. But it also speaks to the mythology that we've kind of created about the man that somehow, you know, all of that, that he was he was in reaction to those things. But he actually was sort of leading the leading edge of that revolution that we thought he was reacting to. He was already much more exactly. firmly fact, rooted. In fact, one of the interesting things I found was people often associate the so-called Southern strategy with Richard Nixon in 1968, when Republicans sought to appeal to, to white right. Southerners yeah. in particular, take them away from the Democratic Party on kind of a law and order platform and you know opposition to civil rights legislation and so forth. And that's true. But Reagan actually pioneered that basic strategy in 1966, two years before the 68 presidential election, and used it to win a massive million in his votes race in California. Governor of California, because this was right after the Watts riots in 65, which alarmed yep. a lot of, you know, white homeowners. And this, this was after protests were starting at Berkeley. And so, you know, a lot of kind of white middle class Americans were horrified about what was going on, and they wanted somebody to defend their values. And that was basically the niche that Ronald Reagan filled. Okay, so that is the perfect, perfect spot to take a quick break and and move now to the rest of the story where it gets really interesting when you connect that dot to the Republican Party that he would come to lead and what it would become after he moved on. The book, Reagan, his life and legend is out now. The author, Max Boot, is right here with us on the Michael Steele podcast. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to we're going to move a little bit closer, a little bit towards the end of the 20th century and into the 21st, because it gets real interesting real fast. We'll be right back, folks, right after this. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michael Steele podcast. Having a great conversation with my buddy Max Boot about his new book, Reagan, His Life and Legend. It's out now. You got to get a copy because it's, yeah, it's a book about Reagan, but it's it's so much more that you begin to understand and contextualize um, what's been 
happening today and how, I mean, just as we went to break, Max, you, you make the nugget <laughs> about the, you know, the 68 race in the Southern strategy. And as someone who's given speeches on some of that, uh, had not appropriately connected that to the 66 California gu gubernatorial race with Ronald Reagan, where that law and order aspect, that Southern white male approach uh, was really kind of formed and created um, and would would stand up um, and be a part of what we would see happen with Reagan later on when he announces for president in Mississippi. Uh, and uh, and and one of the darkest parts of Mississippi in terms of uh, racial history. Um, what in that regard, then, what is the difference between the the Reagan Republican Party that he would take hold of and really shape, having cut the deal with the moral majority on abortion and for the first time putting that plank, that social plank in our more libertarian oriented uh, platform um, in the 1980 race. Uh, and today's GOP, for example, which has cut, cut a deal with Trump uh, on things like tariffs and Putin. Well, I think the, the essential paradox of Ronald Reagan, which really helps to understand why who he, he was who he, he was and, and why Trump is very different. I think the, the essential thing to focus on is the fact that there was a big difference between Reagan as the campaigner and Reagan as somebody who was in office as governor and as president. As a campaigner, he was often quite far to the right, and he accused Democrats of marching America towards communism. He claimed that Medicare and Medicaid and other social welfare legislation was going to lead to the complete loss of freedom in America. He opposed civil rights legislation. And, you know, he talked about welfare queens and law and order. And as you referenced in 1980, he talked about states' rights at the Neshoba County Fair in Mississippi, just a few miles where civil rights workers had been slain in 1964. And so a lot of that convinced, obviously, uh, uh, conservatives in America, the right in America, that he was sort of the right man, that he was their mm -hmm. man, uh, that he that he shared their beliefs, and he largely did. But now here's the key. Here's the key turn. When he was actually in office, he showed that he was not just an ideologue. He was also a pragmatist. He was able to pivot to the center and get things done. And he had nothing but contempt for conservatives who go over the flag, go, who go over the cliff with their flags flying. And that's a quote from Reagan. And he often said, if I if I get 80% of what I want, that's a victory. I don't have to get 100%. So he was able to compromise with Democrats in Sacramento and Washington and able to do things that if anybody else had done, it would horrify Republicans. He signed, for example, the most liberal abortion law in the country as, as governor of California. He raised taxes and raised spending. He, he cuts he cuts taxes and spending in some ways, but he also raised it in other ways. He, in 1986, as president, he signed an immigration bill that legalized millions of undocumented immigrants, what Republicans today would call an amnesty bill. And of course, his crowning achievement as president, after a lifetime as an anti staunch anti-communist, he wound up spending his, his second term as president working with the world's leading communist, Mikhail <laughs> Gorbachev, to yeah. end the Cold War and reform the Soviet Union, even at a time when a lot of conservatives said that he was being snookered, that that Gorbachev was taking him for a ride. But he was convinced that Gorbachev was somebody he could do business with, and he was right. So at the end of the day, what I would argue is what made Reagan a successful campaign or a successful candidate was that he was able to cater uh, and express and embody conservative ideology but what made him a successful leader as both governor and as president was that he was able to transcend that ideology. And I think that's really one, you know, Trump has so many shortcomings, but that's a huge one because with Trump, there's no real difference between him as the campaigner and him mm. as the president. Uh, he doesn't pivot to the center. He doesn't make compromises. And that's why I don't, he's not going to go down as a successful president. And Reagan is because he was able to be much more pragmatic. It's really that streak of pragmatism, which I think accounts for why he's rated as one of the top 10 presidents in our history. It's, do you think that accounts for the the drag on the party in the sense that 
Reagan, you had this you had this movement occur where Democrats moved towards Reagan. You know, you had independents move toward Reagan. Um, and I remember, um, you know, Reagan Democrats uh, playing a very prominent role then. Is, is it that sense, that ability to, to, to be pragmatic when it's required and, and have people see that and trust that, that aspect of your leadership, which is clearly devoid in Trump, uh, which is why his his ceiling is forty six percent. He you know he's not he's not really claiming more than that. And a lot of and a lot of that is really kind of sort of the entertainment value of Donald Trump as opposed to the real substantive, you know, narrative of the man. Well, I think a lot of it was the fact that Reagan was so pragmatic and so willing to compromise. But I think also a lot of it was that he was willing to reach across the aisle, and he had mm -hmm. a very pleasing personality that was kind of a secret weapon in 1964 when reagan as a as a former movie actor was campaigning for barry goldwater and people would hear both goldwater and reagan speaking at the same events they would often come away saying gee i wish reagan were the candidate rather than <laughs> goldwater, because goldwater was this kind of fierce uncompromising take no prisoners conservative who was very gruff and and kind of hard-edged whereas reagan you know, there was I, I ran across a, a newspaper account in the 1960s that said the Reagan personality is like a soothing, warm bathwater. It was very pleasing. He said many of the same things as Goldwater, but he said them with a smile and a twinkle in his eye and a joke that made them go down much easier. And so, you know, it was easy to hate Barry Goldwater or, or a lot of other kind of hard edged conservatives, Newt Gingrich or others later on. It was very hard to hate Ronald Reagan. Very few people you know, actively hated Reagan, especially if they met him, because even if you disagreed with the guy, he was so amiable, so pleasant. And he was also, he didn't engage in kind of the slash and burn rhetoric uh, against his political opponents that you so often heard. In fact, he almost never referred to his political opponents except as my friends or, you know, my friends on the other side of the aisle or something like that. He didn't call them vermin or engage in name calling or anything like that. He understood that, you know, he was a former Democrat turned Republican. So he understood that he had to appeal more than just to his core. And that's why he was able to become so popular, not only with Republicans, but with Democrats. What you, you referenced uh, the Cold War and Gorbachev. And uh, I was really intrigued in the section of the book where you talk about Reykjavik and, 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 and sort of the drama behind there. And it is true what you said early at the beginning of our conversation about having access to more information that's now been opened and released. You you sort of have a different, you almost a different takeaway from some of that of that period where the sort of space defense initiative, strategic uh, SDI, strategic I think it was strategic defense initiative, yeah, strategic defense initiative. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was was all was was actually one of those things that that um uh, played a bigger role in 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 than than I think we may realize in terms of how both sides looked at that relative to the the relationship with the cold war what did that what did reagan's relationship with gorbachev uh demonstrate or say about the interactions between these two leaders relative to how we see a president trump uh, and a President Biden uh, deal with uh, global leaders today. And, and what are some of the things that we, we should be learning from what Reagan did uh, during his time? Well, there's this prevalent myth, myth that Ronald Reagan brought down the evil empire that with his defense spending and his support for, you know, freedom fighters in Afghanistan and elsewhere, he, he destroyed the Soviet Union. And what I found after doing my research is that's not really true. I mean, he did increase defense spending and he did confront the Soviet Union during his first term, calling it the evil empire and so forth. But that was not what ended the Cold War. In fact, that ratcheted up tensions uh, with the Soviet Union to a dangerous level such that he, by 1984, even Ronald Reagan himself was pulling back. And he, he understood that the risk of nuclear war was real. And he was talking about how much Soviets and Americans, ordinary people had in common. But the problem, and he really wanted to meet with a Soviet leader. He really wanted to end the Cold War and to get rid of nuclear weapons. But he didn't have a partner for peace in, in, during his first term because, you know, all, all these old line uh, Soviet leaders 
were in power and they one after another kept dying. So there was nobody he could really talk to. <laughs> it was only really in 1985 when Chernenko dies and Mikhail Gorbachev, who's only in his mid fifties, comes to power that the dynamic changes because Gorbachev was a real black swan. He was somebody who rose to the top of this dictatorship, but lost faith in the dictatorship. He really wanted to humanize the Soviet Union. He wanted to end the arms race. He thought that defense spending was wasteful. He wanted to deliver a better quality of life uh, for the people of the Soviet Union. It was ultimately his radically reformist ideas that led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, which mm -hmm. wasn't intended, but that was the result. And it wasn't Ronald Reagan's pressure that led to to the collapse of the Soviet Union it was really Gorbachev's reforms and, and the changes that they unleashed. But Reagan, and I think he deserves tremendous credit for this, he understood that Gorbachev was somebody he could work with. That They met in 1985 for the first time at the Geneva summit. And that was really, Reagan often said, was the most important moment of his entire presidency. That was really the turning point when he, because a lot of people were on the right, including his own defense secretary, Caspar Weinberger, very suspicious of Gorbachev. They just thought he was, you know, he was a died in the wool communist who was trying to snooker us into disarming. And then Reagan met with them, talked with them and understood, no, he was not, he was somebody different, somebody that he could actually work with. And so Reagan and Gorbachev worked together to peacefully end the Cold War. And Reagan helped Gorbachev to peacefully reform the Soviet Union such that by 1987, they signed the first treaty to abolish an entire class of nuclear weapons, the intermediate range yeah. uh, nuclear, nuclear treaty. That was a, a, a tremendous achievement. So I give Reagan a lot of credit for helping to end the Cold War peacefully, but it wasn't for the thing that a lot of people try to give him credit for, which was his confrontational approach. It was, in fact, for his conciliatory approach with Gorbachev and, and being willing to work with them. And I think there's a lesson here, you know, when we think about how to work with, how to deal with China or other countries today, a lot of people are suggesting, oh, we should take this Reagan confrontational approach. Well, my concern is, it's not going to work so well. It could actually raise the risk of war. It's only, you know, the way to really in intentions with with China is you need a partner for peace. You don't have that right now. Right, you don't have Xi it. Xi Jinping, right. who is a hardliner, but if Xi Jinping is, is is succeeded by somebody who's more a reformer in the Gorbachev mode, then you can actually make progress. But right now, just you know, ratcheting up the tensions is not going to bring down China any more than it brought down the Soviet Union in the 1980s. I thought this was interesting. You, you, you call Reagan's assassination attempt uh, his finest hour. Um, why did you? Why? Why was that? And 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 quite honestly, did Trump's assassination attempt have a similar effect for him? I'm still I mean, there's working no, there's that no through. Comparison I think. Of the two because you know maybe maybe Trump's ear was grazed by a bullet, maybe not. But Reagan was almost killed. I mean, he was very close to dying. He was he was shot. But even while he was facing the greatest adversity of his life, he managed to keep his humor. And the fact, you know, in the hospital, he was joking with the doctors. I hope you're all Republicans. You know, he'll right. tell you, Nancy Reagan, honey, I forgot to duck. That was really showing this kind of grace under under pressure, this kind of courage under fire. He was, you know, almost acting like one of these tough guy Warner Brothers heroes of the 1930s. But this wasn't a movie. This was real life. The pain was real. He really was close to dying. And yet he managed to keep his wits about him and to show tremendous resiliency under adversity. And that that's why I call that chapter finest hour. And I think it really cemented his bond with the American people because they saw what kind of person he was. And that's why so many people had this part of the reason so many people had this enduring affection for him because of the way he behaved during, you know, the greatest personal crisis of his life. I remember that uh, so well. I was uh, graduating from Hopkins that year and uh, that spring and that that when that event happened, I mean, because for me as a Catholic, I mean, it was a two for you had Reagan followed by the Pope. Um, right. And it, it just and that was would become a very interesting alliance as well between Reagan and John Paul, uh, Pope John Paul the first. What what did you see in that? In that combo, uh, in that combo meal that uh, that a lot of us uh, may have missed. Well, I don't think it was it was a formal alliance per se between Pope John Paul II and, and Reagan. I mean, they were both anti-communist, and I think they both had an impact with their anti-communism. But it wasn't like that they were working. So there's kind of a mythology that they work closely together, to bring down communism in Poland. I think that's from what I've seen in in, in my research. 
that's that's somewhat exaggerated. Before I let you get, I got a couple more uh, just to kind of round because, like I said, there's just so many aspects of this book that I think uh, are really revealing about Reagan himself. Um, there have been a lot of biographies. I'm looking up here on my shelf. I've got two shelves that are Reagan books, and now I'm going to be adding yours to that. Um, I'm looking at Dutch and and Reagan. Uh, which one is that? Reagan the and his journey, his, his own journey, and all of that. Um, what what angle in exploration did you want to take with this book? Um, and I think you have an advantage that, as you noted before, that others didn't, because now you could peel back the curtain a little bit more with additional information and insight. But I suspect it was a little bit more than that, Max, that that brought you to uh, to the point where you wanted to share this this Reagan story. Well, no, it was really I mean, I wasn't I wasn't trying to promote any particular argument or storyline about Reagan. I was just trying to understand Reagan. And he he was not an easy guy to understand. I mean, he was always sort of hiding in plain sight. And uh, but, you know, everybody thought they knew him. But in fact, the people who were closest to him often said that he was kind of an enigma to them. You know, he was somebody who was famously challenging for biographers like Edmund Morris or others who were really stumped by by Reagan because he had very little self-reflection and he didn't really want to look back on what he had done. And so you kind of had to interpret it for him. And that's and that's that's been my challenge in writing the book. But I think, you know, I, I think I took that head on and, 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 and hope that I certainly the reviews would suggest that I uh, succeeded. I mean, it was it was a real challenge, but it was really understanding. Uh, I think one of our more inscrutable presidents, and I think, but it, it was it was a, you know, a ten year effort, but it was it was ultimately rewarding. Did this book uh, force you to examine the question? Was was Reagan part of the rot that uh, that has now eaten the Republican Party? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something I looked at, and my conclusion is that. You know, no question, Reagan and Trump are vastly different personalities and, and vastly different politics. I mean, Reagan was pro free trade, pro NATO, pro immigration, anti Russian expansion. Uh, he he was very civil, never engaged in name calling. The differences, you know, add up very quickly, and and the differences are much greater than the similarities. But I think you can kind of wide angle camera view. What you can see is that. Basically, there was a turning point in the Republican Party in 1964 when Barry Goldwater became president. That was mm -hmm. the year when most Republicans in Congress, the vast majority, supported civil rights legislation, but Barry Goldwater did not. He was the nominee of the party, and Reagan was one of his most articulate spokesmen. And so the party, you know, uh, kind of rejected yes. know, centrist, centrist Republicanism of the kind that Nelson Rockefeller embodied. And it started to move farther to the right. And I think what's basically happened since 64 is that every generation of Republicans is further to the right than the previous one. So that mm -hmm. uh, Reagan was further to the right than Nixon and Ford. And Trump is way further to the right uh, than Reagan. And so like every generation looks back at the last one and says, those guys are the rhinos. We're the real Republicans. But if you look at what's been happening, it's part of this continuous right, right wing drift since 1964. And Reagan was certainly part of that in the 1980s. But the irony, Michael, is that in the 1980s, when people talked about Reagan taking over the Republican Party, they were talking about a more conservative movement in America about yeah. taking the Republican Party in the country to the right. But today, in 2024 America, if the Republican Party adopted Reaganism, it would be moving to the center, it would be moving to the left, it would still be conservative, but it would be moving away from the right wing fringe. And that's I think a big picture. That's what's happened over the last fifty plus years. It it it, it has indeed, and having been in the in the middle of a lot of that change over the years, um, it has been something for me to sort of reconcile uh, with as well. And you know, I still question, okay, why the hell are you hanging out here on the front porch of this dilapidated building once known as the GOP? You know, I, I call I, I call myself a Motel Six re Republican. Someone's got to keep the lights on, right? Um, but and bless you for doing that. Right. <laughs> I'm, hey, Max, I'm just crazy, bro. I'm just crazy. But uh, you know, I I would talk about Reagan when I gave speeches um, in my early days, and even to this day, uh, I, I would I talked about Reagan making it cool to be a Republican, and he yeah, did. Absolutely. 
because yeah. he absolutely did. Um, and there wasn't, there wasn't, the differences were on, on, on the detail of policy or whether or not we're going to spend this much or that much. Today, it's a very different feeling. Um, the people who do not want to associate themselves with this once proud grand old party, uh, because we by and large pretty much make it clear we just don't like you if you don't align with us. Um, and that's not Reagan at all. And and that's probably the most frustrating aspect among many things for me um, as um, as I look back on that young 17 year old kid who, who was sitting glued uh, watching that convention speech on television in 1976 and deciding I can follow that guy. I, I want to join his party. He believed in a big tent and he believed in the 11th commandment of thou shall not speak ill of fellow Republicans. And both of those things have obviously fallen by the wayside as with the MAGA takeover. Max Boot. Uh, he's written a, another good one, folks. Uh, he really has Reagan, his life and legend. It, it is out now. Uh, pick it up uh, wherever you get your books, Amazon, etc. cetera. Uh, definitely check it out. Max, I, thank you for coming and uh, sharing a lot of uh, your work uh, on this project with us and certainly writing this book in a way that, you know, someone like me can sort of get into it and and find himself again in in a lot of what um reagan meant to me as a young man and and certainly you know why why i still believe in the in the in the hope of a republican party in whatever form it takes in the future <laughs> not quite sure what that is going to be yet but yeah. you you have written another good one my friend and i'm so glad you could come and share it with us it was it was a pleasure to be on with you, Michael. You're one of my favorite people, and this was truly a privilege to be to be on here with you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That means a lot, folks. You don't know. I I followed Max Boot from the very beginning, and um, you know he's up there with some of the great thinkers uh, in the Republican Party, or not even so much the Republican Party, but this this conservative uh, sense of 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 service and purpose and. I just appreciate you, man. I really do. And thank you, sure. folks. Feeling is mutual. Follow Max on Twitter, X, whatever the hell Elon's calling it today, at Max <laughs> Boot. Um, be sure to pick up a copy of Reagan, His Life and Legend. It's going to make a great birthday gift for all those birthdays between now and Christmas. A Thanksgiving present. Yes, I actually give gifts at Thanksgiving, believe it or not. And, of course, Christmas. So they got many times to buy multiple copies of Max book, Max's book. So we appreciate that. Uh, appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Please tell a friend about it, share it, give us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find me on Twitter at Michael Steele and the Michael Steele podcast on Twitter at Steele underscore podcast. Love it when you uh, do that. And certainly always happy to be a part of the Bulwark Network. You can find them on social media at Bulwark Online. Until next time, because the next time we talk, we'll be one step closer to fall. Uh, well, you know, take care of yourself, folks. Be safe out there. And don't forget to register and vote. Register and vote. Two steps. That's all you have to do. That's all I'm going to ask you to do. Register and vote. Until next time, take care. Take care.